Welcome to Conservation Fridays. Where nature meets neighbor. I'm Jamie Lewis Hedges, Executive Director of Berry Conservation District. And I'm Rachel France, Conservation Technician at Berry Conservation District. You said technician, and I'm thinking that we might, maybe, knock on wood, be set up better than we were last week. Well, I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bit of a fiasco uh, last week where uh, we had to adjust quickly, and then we were knocking over video and throwing oh, no. microphones around. It was it was a good time. <laughs> Well, our guest today is Michelle Schedule. Michelle has been the executive director of Pierce Cedar Creek Institute for 22 years. For those who don't know, PCCI is a nature center. It's also an environmental education center, as well as a biological field station. That is to say, a destination of learning, research, and natural resource management on 850 acres of Michigan outdoors. Michelle has been an instrumental force at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute and in Barry County. She has successfully managed a private foundation and environmental institute with a substantial budget of $1.4 million and an impressive $22 million endowment. She has demonstrated exemplary leadership by overseeing a widely respected team of scientists, educators, land managers, and experienced providers. She's been a key player in fostering collaboration with a consortium of 11 colleges and universities toward their summer research program at PCCI. She is a striking figure in the local community and well-known for civic engagement through the Rotary Club of Hastings, Barry County Parks and Recreation Commission, Leadership Barry County, and other organizations. In fact, it was as her guest to a Rotary luncheon that I first got to know Michelle. Thank you very much for doing that. She was kind in supporting my introduction to the community as a newly hired executive uh, director in the area, and she offered me some sound guidance that I really appreciated. In short, Michelle Schedule's leadership reflects a commitment to environmental education, community engagement, and successful fundraising initiatives. We're eager to talk today about place building and community building in natural resource conservation, and we know Michelle has a lot to teach us in this regard. Michelle, thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. That was a wonderful intro. Can I get a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I decided to let Jamie do the intro since I have such a hard time with your last name for oh, yes, whatever yes. reason. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand. <laughs> Well, we're really excited to talk to you today, and we're eager to learn from your experiences. But before we dive in, Rachel, does Berry Conservation District have some trees for sale? We sure do. And I want to take a moment to invite all of our listeners to check out an order from their local Conservation District tree sales. Tree sales are the main earned income for conser conservation districts around the state of Michigan. Most districts are taking orders right now for pickups in the spring, including us. So if you're looking to improve the quality of habitat on your property, we encourage you to support your local conservation district by purchasing native bare root tree seedlings now. For those of you in Barry County, you can find our tree sale online at berrycd.org backslash trees. And we've been pretty thankful to people for jumping on there and buying some trees uh, already. We've had a pretty good flow. I, I don't think I'm flooding your email anymore with uh, notifications, am I? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> but we've been we've been thankful for everybody that's uh, showed up there already. Okay, Michelle, I'm really eager to talk with you today. And uh, I've got to say, after a lot of Googling, I am impressed, surprised that you are largely digital anonymous. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> Separate uh, from PCCI, Barry County, and everything uh, that you're involved in right now, I just want to start off by learning about you. Who are you? Sure, sure. And you know that wonderful introduction you gave me, I'm very digitally anonymous because I work with wonderful people that do all that stuff you talked about. So um, I am, yes, a long time uh, resident here at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. I actually grew up in a small town in Iowa and um, 
went to started my college at University of South Dakota, then decided to spread my wings and went out to California and got a degree in journalism, public relations. That's where I met my wonderful husband, who happens to be from Hastings, Michigan, and why I came back. Um, and so happy to have come back to this beautiful area. I, this is home for me now. We've raised two children um, who are all now grown, and actually one has come back to the West Michigan area. The other one is in St. Louis, two boys. Um, but uh, this is our home. So I saw on LinkedIn that you worked as an airline agent for over a decade. That is really fascinating to me. It's something that I actually was interested in. Uh, a I, back. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? I did when um, after graduating college and for coming back. Well, right after college, I worked for United Way in Salinas, California, and I would go out to the lettuce fields and asked the migrant workers to donate to United Way, and they were amazingly generous. When I moved back to Hastings, it just happened that American Airlines was just opening up at the Grand Rapids Airport. So I put my blue suit on and decided to interview with American Airlines, got the job, and worked for them Worked at the airport maybe five years, and then I worked for our um, travel agency side where I called on travel agents that had our computer system. So I trained them on our computer system first, and then I um, negotiated computer contracts with them. That was a great job, too. Uh, when my kids were young, I decided to go back to the airport and then American pulled out. So I made a, a career transition. But I'll tell you back then that uh, you guys are younger. But back then when you worked at the airlines, I was still saying, would you like smoking or non-smoking to give you an idea of how things have changed? So, <laughs> yes, it was an experience. It was a lot of fun. That that brought up a few questions, uh, and I have to ask you what what during those years what was the most interesting uh, thing you observed or interaction you had? Okay, I'm going to tell our the people listening. I'm going to give them a. I'm going to tell them a secret that you maybe it's not a secret, but you share some question ideas with us ahead of time, and. Um, I have some very interesting stories, and if anybody wants to have a drink with me sometime, I'll share them with them. <laughs> but I both of us. I'm not, so. <laughs> not going to share them now. But I've got some great stories, believe you. Um, but I I am going to share something. Um, I remember working at the airport, and I still get chills when it's. Uh, Foggy. Fog is the worst when you're working at the airport. And I remember one spring break and it was foggy and the flights were a mess. And I was this beautiful, wonderful family with three kids was going to Florida to Disney World. And I was trying to get them rebooked because flights were canceled. It was spring break. The kids were standing there with mom and dad in front of me. And no matter what I tried, I couldn't do it. And I felt so bad that I actually had to send this family home. They didn't go to Disney World for spring break. And they were the nicest family ever. And I think that's what I remember. So I, I felt so bad, but they were so understanding. Can you imagine that? So that, so that is the story that I will share with you. Yeah. People are great. I appreciate hearing that because it's too easy to uh, end up in those situations in the airport and assume that the person on the other side of the counter doesn't, you know, feel for you. Um, right. So they yeah. actually do. Their heart does go out and they're trying their yeah. best. Yeah. 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 I think I can see a connection then with the compassion, you know, for people that you would naturally have a passion for the natural environment. So when did you 
really become first interested in nature or the environment and and what led you to seek the position that you are currently feeling? That's a great question. You know, after uh, my airline career, uh, and I could have moved with American, but we decided not to. We wanted to stay in West Michigan. Um, I was hired by Frederick Meyer Gardens as their, I think I started as a development associate and, and, um, and was promoted later to development director. And so, you know, from American Airlines to Frederick Meyer Gardens, have I worked at wonderful places or what? Mm -hmm. um, I worked at the gardens five years after it opened. I was there when they unveil unveiled the Da Vinci horse, which was we set up this huge outdoor tent and recreated Italy. It was an amazing experience. I'll tell you, working at the gardens was wonderful. Um, uh, after all the work we did to unveil the Da Vinci horse, I remember my boss saying to me that, okay, Fred, Fred Meyer, next, there, there was a, a water pool outside, a natural uh, water area outside our building. And he said, for the next event, we're going to put a floating platform on that water pool and have everybody out on that. And I remember the staff standing around going, hmm, okay, I guess we can figure that out. And he said, no, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> But that's the type of environment we worked in. So it was a lot of fun. Um, but I lived in Hastings, had two smaller children, worked in Grand Rapids, worked long hours in Grand Rapids. And, it, and I saw a position in the paper that said, um, uh, director of a foundation in Hastings, the Willard G. Pierce and Jesse M. Pierce Foundation. And I thought, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be nice to live and work in the same community? I hadn't ever really done that. I hadn't been able to get involved in Hastings because I was always in Grand Rapids and I was so busy at the gardens in Grand Rapids. And that was just kind of their culture because we were growing, we were doing so much that we weren't really involved with the Grand Rapids community. So as much as honestly, I loved my job, I thought, wouldn't it be great to live and work in the same community? I'm gonna apply for this job. <clears throat> and the job was overseeing a foundation. Well, the, I got the job. And um, a few months after I got the job, uh, Dr. Gary Pierce was overseeing the Institute and he was a wetlands expert, taught wetlands courses and realized that he was not an administrator. So he said, gosh, doesn't it make sense that at the time my office was in Hastings, doesn't it make sense for you to come out here, oversee everything, and then that allow me more time for teaching? So that's what I did. So I came about it a roundabout way, but I have stayed here for 20, going on 23 years because of my love of what Pierce Cedar Creek Institute is all about. And through administrative support and all kinds of ideas that sometimes our staff probably wishes I wouldn't have, just like the floating uh, platform on the lake, um, <laughs> maybe not that bad. Uh, it's just been it's just been a joy to be a part of. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to adapt our questions here just a little bit, Rachel, if you can hang with me. But I'm thinking uh, right now about that uh, process, Michelle, and thinking about um, working at Frederick Meyer Gardens and, you know, the connection there with creativity and uh, the outdoor, uh, you know, for those who don't know, Frederick Meyer Gardens is one of the premier nature-based facilities in West Michigan. And I'm pinging back in my brain to what you shared a little bit ago about working with migrant farmers in California. And I'm wondering if there was an appreciation there for uh, working with 
a community and in agricultural outdoor environments was there something there that stuck with you and and uh connected those experiences for you yeah that's that's a great question and you know as i mentioned i grew up in iowa i grew up in a very small town i was a town girl but i would ride my bike out to my grandma and grandpa's farm uh, so I have that background. I went out to school in San, at San Jose State, so I experienced the big city. So I think when coming to, when as being a part of the Institute, it is appreciation, uh, appreciating what you have and understanding your role in the community and how you can best serve that community and, and utilizing the resources the best way possible to serve your mission and serve the people. So I sometimes I tell people because here we have we have the research program. We have the we have the consortium with colleges and universities um, who come for the summer and do research. We have an amazing facility here, as you all know, a small facility. But I tell people, we I don't I don't think we will ever be a Grand Valley State University. You know, people think, do you grow and grow and grow? No, the way we, we we have grown and we will grow somewhat, but our footprint, I think, is is the best place from which to serve our community and fit within what we should be doing, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, we've been working ever since I started, we've worked under a strategic plan. Well, a couple of years ago, we started on more of a long range plan and we've shared that with our members, but, and our staff has done a lot of work. Our mission is to inspire the appreciation and stewardship of the environment. Okay. So if I said to Jamie, what does inspire the appreciation and stewardship of the environment mean? Or I said to Rachel or anyone else, you might come up with very different answers, right? And so our staff has spent a lot of time trying to ferret out what that means. So we make sure that the resources we have or working toward that mission. And um, we are always learning. You know, we are the first ones to say, we will try things, we will adapt, and we will adjust and keep going. And it's been fun, I have to say, before I let you ask another question, <laughs> it's been fun to watch. When I first started at the Institute, we would have a few programs a year and we would if we got 10 people to a program we were happy i mean we were a new facility and unlike most nonprofits are you know you're kind of built and you grow with, as you you know as people as your your supporters grow and and the recognition grows you grow with that where the institute because of bill pierce's generosity was built and when i started it was build an employee manual build procedures uh uh organized programs. And I say that I didn't do all that, but I mean, we were kind of, we created all of that. And it's been, it's been such a pleasure to see when we have 60, 70 people to a program now. I mean, that's what, you know, that's, that's the important part. Definitely. Definitely. So how, Moving from all these different places, especially Grand Rapids to Hastings, which I uh, really, I really get. I used to work in Grand Rapids as well, but I lived in Middleville. So when this position here opened up, I was so excited to be local. And now I almost never uh, leave Hastings. Yeah. <laughs> it's got everything I need. Um, but how, you know, it, it can be a hard community to connect with. So how did you kind of tackle that going from, a Grand Rapids based area to a more rural 
community? How did you make that transition? Yeah, that, yes. And, and, you know, until I started working here, I didn't know the community. One of the best things I did right away was join Rotary. Uh, Rotary was an opportunity to connect with people. And uh, just a big part of what I do is interacting with the community and assisting in, in various ways in different organizations as I could. And, and really, that was the best way to get to know the community and for the community to get to know me. And, and, and um, you know, it took time to build confidence in, in me and my organization. I remember when I first started, people thought there's an institute out there and I'm not quite sure what they do out there. I mean, literally that I don't, you know, before this, gra this gravel road went through there and there were a few homes and now there's, I've heard it's called Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. What's that all about? Well, it has taken time for people to trust us. And I think, um, you know, just doing what we say we're doing, helping people understand that we're here to help. And this kind of gets to the heart of, of, of what I believe in is helping them see that this is a safe place to learn. You know, we're not going to tell them they can't do this or they shouldn't do this. But we're going to, we provide a place where people can come and hear information and decide for themselves. And I, and it takes time. Michelle, we're going to take a break here. And after that break, I want to get into sort of lessons from your experience that you would uh, pass on to others like myself who are you know, relatively new to an executive director position or maybe looking at that and thinking about how to navigate entering a community and uh, working on natural resource issues. Um, but before we do that, I want to take a moment to invite everyone here to uh, order native bare root trees at your local conservation district tree sale. Like Rachel shared earlier, tree sales are the main earned income of conservation districts around the state of Michigan. And right now is the time of year that most of us uh, open up the order forms for those and allow people to get in their orders and then uh, hand out those trees later on in April. So if you're looking at landscaping and improving the quality of backyard habitat on your property, we encourage you to support your local conservation district. Go check them out, give them a phone call, an email, ask them uh, when you can put in your order. For Barry County, it's right now, and you can find our tree sale at barrycd.org backslash trees. That's B-A-R-R-Y-C-D.org backslash T-R-E-E-S. Yes, and if you do have any questions about maybe what kind of tree species you would want to plant on your property, districts also have foresters available for consultation. So reach out. So Michelle, tell me, what does being the executive director entail besides all the, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a lot. So you're directing a lot of different things. And uh, other than the things you've already mentioned, is there additional work that you have to do? Um, you know, um, I was at a program Friday and, and sit it and we were at lunch sitting with someone and they asked me that. And I'll tell you, I paused for a very long time and thinking about it. Um, the, I love my job because of the variety of what is involved. I mean, I have a board of directors, eight, eight board members that I, you know, that I report to that I do the usual preparing for board meetings, um, minutes, uh, work with my finance people. We're blessed to have an endowment. So I've learned about investments um, and work with investment managers. But um, 
It's everything from, I just got off a meeting with a few of our staff to talk about how we can communicate better with our, our regular calendar of events to understand who's doing what when and who needs to do different things. Um, I certainly assist with fundraising. Uh, we have staff that does that too, but certainly that's uh, a big part of it. And um, programming. I mean, I have my ideas and thoughts and share them with, with everyone. I, um, I think that, you know, my degree, I just have an undergraduate degree from many years ago in public relations. So I'm not a natural resource expert, but I think that in a way, because of my interest in all of this and my interest in learning, I can help relate to others the value of that interest in learning. If I can, you know, say anything that I love to ask questions. I my husband hates it, but I love to question him. <laughs> <laughs> and and honestly, just, you know, if anything, I think as you go in and think about what what we all can do for the environment, I think my biggest message is to ask questions, listen to people, um, and be open to learning, you know. Mm -hmm. I love that. There's um there's a therapist that I listen to on podcasts that um, talks about the important thing that we can do is to create curiosity around the things in our lives. And when we have curiosity about it, we're in a place of creativity and, and thriving and excitement and delight. Um, and, you know, speaking to that, putting together educational programs for the environment is at its base trying to create curiosity i think about the outdoors and about nature and the third leg of that is is community so can you know can you tie that all together for uh, us yeah jamie i was just going to say that because because in order to create that curiosity and interest in, in learning, you have to meet people where they're at, right? So you have so that's a big part of it. And 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 you all probably I know you all know this, but the challenge is is when you get a room of 50 people, they can be coming from very different places. So how do you communicate with all those different people? But and so what you do is do a variety of things. And that's what Pierce Cedar Creek Institute does. You take people out on hikes. You invite them to stewardship work days. You have lunch and learn programs because you know there's that group that wants to come and have lunch. And by the way, hear this one hour speaker. Um, you do workshops. You do Thanks to COVID, you you offer them on Zoom. You know, you do all these different things to try to reach people where they're at and get them engaged with learning more and doing more. I mentioned earlier that we're working on long range planning and and what we're really focused on now is, and we are working on this and learning, but working on how do you take that that learning and engagement and change it into action? Because what we need people to do is to take action when it comes to, of course, a lot of things, but what we're talking about is in environmental issues. It's great to know about something, but if you don't take action toward that, it's, you know, and curiosity. Where are we gonna be? And curiosity really becomes the the fuel for that. If if there's no curiosity, then you have a, then you have overwhelm, perhaps. Like maybe that's the opposite. Um, that you don't what you don't want is full stops. You don't want people becoming so overwhelmed with the situation that they 
don't know what action to take next. Exactly, exactly. Or they feel that it's such a big issue that they can't do anything, but that's not true. Each of us can always do something. And that's what we're really, for our community, really trying to focus on. I, that just really made me think a lot. I mean, I'm already very much in love with native plants, but that was native plants and invasive species was really my first introduction to Pierce when I was at my last job. I did a work day removing purple loose strife and oh. I just, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was gosh, seven years ago, maybe now. I don't know. It's been a while, but then you also grow native plants, mm -hmm. which I think is incredible. And I, mm -hmm. I think you're the only native plant grower commercially in the county i would guess so in the county yep and that's probably i guess to connect that that's my one small move for people to better the environment is to just plant native you yeah. know that's, that's always my main message but uh so go back to my my questions here i don't want to get too off track um so as the executive director of Pierce, you've been deeply involved in building a sense of place, which you spoke about. Yep. And how do you envision the Institute contributing to the identity of Barry County as a whole and fostering a connection between the community and natural environment, which again, you, you really did speak to, but I guess, is there a plan to get more of the county to you to show them really, and that's probably in your long range plan too? Well, <laughs> You know, I guess that's always something that you that you know you're always working on, and and we talk about that too. A lot of times with our programs, we talk about you know sometimes we're speaking to the choir, and how do you reach out beyond the choir? So it's something you're always working on. But you bring up native plants, and I think, and already I think they've proven to be native plants are a great way to engage a wide audience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think Jim Brown would mind if I told you I was just at a meeting with the, the Hastings Township about maybe planting native plants at the Hastings Township. And thanks to our stewardship manager, Mary Parr, we have the resources to reach out to people to help them understand that they can change their lawn into a prairie and the benefits of that and that it's very doable and very manageable. And I think some of those things, kind of like I was saying, is reaching out and helping people understand that they can complete these projects. Um, one of the volunteer efforts I've been working on is called Operation Pollination. And it was a, it started as a rotary initiative, but it's a it's a rotary community initiative to help support our endangered pollinators by planting native plants and by educating people on the importance of that. So you've got the best of both worlds. You're helping people understand why it's so important and they're getting their hands in the dirt. They're seeing the difference. They're um, realizing that they can do it. And we're trying to use those experiences so other people will see that and say that they can do it too which means working with the media um, and other people doing social media and all that good stuff. <laughs> Since you jumped into that uh, about Operation Pollination, tell me what uh, what's the, how's that process gone as far as building that? And uh, what's the biggest area of action right now? Yeah, it's gone. It has gone great. We started the effort. As I say, it started with Rotary and we really kicked it off kind of at the beginning of 2003. 
And you talk about community. We have an operation pollination committee. We have 10 Rotarians on the committee and we have 10 non-Rotarians on the committee. And I'll tell you these days to get 20 volunteers together to work on something is, is an accomplishment in itself. But it's yeah. been so cool to see that the, the garden club representatives and general community members and women's club and different groups. And we even have a Kwanian on our, on our committee. Yes. Um, but it's a pat, we have a pastor. So um, it's really been a community effort. We planted a couple, we actually, we applied for a small grant. We had uh, from the KCC Kellogg Community College Foundation and planted a beautiful 400 square foot native garden at the Faisenfeld Center in Hastings. Uh, we planted a garden at the Battle Creek Outdoor Ed Center, and we held a workshop at Pierce on how to take care of native plants. So there have been a, really a, a lot of effort. We've, we, we started a project called Plots for Pollinators, where we encourage people, even if you do a four foot by four foot plot to start with, start with plots for pollinators and grow from there. And um, we utilize resources wisely. So the Institute is involved with a lot of artists here. So I called on a couple of our artist friends and they designed wonderful logos for us. We made little signs that people can put in their gardens. And we have, we're trying to map each plots for pollinators garden. We do, we did it, we had about 14 last year. So work will continue this year. Uh, we're already talking about possibly doing a garden at um, the Berry Community Foundation or working with the chamber for a planter, planter gardens in their area. Um, I did a talk at the Charlotte Rotary Club a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Alive um, uh, e event facility in Charlotte. It's an amazing place if you ever want to go check it out. Um, but he talked about the director's going to put a pollinator garden in there. So it's, you know, it's a matter of talking, pushing, promoting, doing, <laughs> and, and it grows. And, you know, um, who doesn't love working in the yard and getting your hands in the dirt and messing around with plants? It's, it's fun. So we have fun. It's definitely my favorite part is getting my hands dirty and, and just planting and getting in the garden and moving plants around but uh yeah and you know the but one of the best parts of it too is it doesn't matter your age you know get the kids involved get grandma and grandpa involved it's it's something that families can do it's it's yeah definitely i know both my girls love to be in the garden one more than the other but uh yeah just to eat whatever's grown. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure that before we get away, Michelle, um, I'd like if, if there was um, advice or, or um, guidance that you would give uh, people who are working in conservation, natural resources, um, outdoor recreation, what advice would you give them based on your experiences? You know, I actually, I just thought of this, um, and maybe I have a couple, but at least this is one thing through my years I've noticed is there's a lot of great organizations out there doing great work. But if you don't put the money and the effort into marketing, it really limits what you can do. And I think sometimes as nonprofits, we forget 
that that's an important part of it. You know, we feel like it's 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 always got to be the next program or the next workshop or whatever you're doing, the next tree sale or whatever. But I I would I would recommend to boards and nonprofits think about investing in telling people about what you're doing. Um, and um, I think that then maybe we can all work a little more toward behavior change of changing that, you know, that information that you've just got into, into action and reaching more people. Andrews has a lot of events to reach people and also a pretty I think a pretty robust social media outreach program, but out of all these events and programs, could you highlight maybe one <laughs> upcoming event or project that you have on the horizon? I certainly can. Um, I, and, and I guess that's one thing that I would say to people listening that whether you, if you've never been to the Institute, I or to an organization that's offering environmental programs, give it a try. Um, I know sometimes it's hard. You know, I, re, I it's hard to go to a new place. You don't always feel comfortable. You um, not maybe not quite sure how things work, but give it a try, and I think you'll 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 be glad you did. And we have a session, uh, a speaker series that just started called Conservation in a Changing World Lecture Series. And Ellen Holstey, our program manager, does an amazing job in setting up these speakers. They're very informal. We like to eat here at the Institute. So most of them, there's also a meal involved, which is always good. You can pick if you just want to come to the talk. Um, but um, lots of different topics, you know, uh, a topic that that is the very in front of us in the news is climate change. And people have all kinds of opinions on that and thoughts and, you know, come hear some different thoughts and ideas from different people and see what you think. It might inspire you to learn more and worse comes to worse, you've had a nice outing and a good meal. So um, Conservation in a Changing World is a program. I encourage you to look at at our website. All our programs are on our website for members and our membership starts at just $40 a month. A lot of our programs are free to members. Of course, the, the property is open to walk the trails and, and enjoy nature that way. So I, I really encourage people, if you haven't been here, come visit. And um, if you have been here, come more often. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I enjoy every single time that uh, I am at Pier Cedar Creek Institute and enjoying the property and every event that I've uh, been there for has just been a real uh, wonderful experience. Uh, so um, kudos to uh, the Institute and uh, congratulations to you for all the amazing work that you've done there. And just want to say thank you. And we really appreciate you being a part of our conversation here today, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And I will personally endorse that uh, that program that you mentioned. I attended last Friday, and yes, I really you did. It. Yes, and I also really enjoyed the lunch. I've never been disappointed. But awesome! <laughs> anyway. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. So join us next month on Friday, March first, and we'll be talking to Christine Charles of Michigan State University's Extension and Kellogg Biological Station. We're looking forward to talking more with her about farming and sustainability, both economically and ecologically. Have a good rest of your day, y'all. Thanks.